We begin the news at this hour in Nigeria, where the Trade Union Congress, TUC, has called on the federal government to fix a new minimum wage to tackle the rising cost of living in the country. Since the removal of few subsidies, the cost of living has spiked and inflation figures pushing new highs in the country. Although there has been a protest and meetings between labor unions and authorities to roll out measures to ease the hardship, TUC President Festo Susifo called for a review of the 30,000 naira minimum wage. He spoke in Abuja on Monday during a press briefing barely 24 hours before the commencement of a nationwide protest by the Nigeria Labour Congress over the high cost of living. And of course, uh, we will have our correspondent, Marvelous Obomanu, join us to uh, give us more insights on this in the course of the bulletin. And uh, still staying on issues in Nigeria, in a related development, the presidency again has warned the Nigeria Labour Congress not to embark on its two-day nationwide protest against the rising cost of living in the country. On Friday 16, the NLC announced the nationwide protest scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday over the alleged government's failure to implement agreements reached between both parties on October 2, 2023, following the removal of your subsidy. The special advisor to the president on information and strategy, Bayo Onanuga, and the police handed down the warnings as 65 civil society groups on Sunday pulled out of the planned demonstration, warning against its possible hijack, arguing that it could worsen the deteriorating situation. The NLC president, Joajero, had insisted in a statement on Sunday that the protest would be held on Tuesday and Wednesday as planned. The decision followed the conclusion of a 14-day ultimatum issued to the federal government to implement measures against the widespread hardship. In the meantime, the Nigerian police force has deployed security operatives across the state in anticipation of planned protests slated for tomorrow. Now, New Central's crew roving at the state observed heavy presence of police personnel at Ojota and Surulere area of Lagos State. Joining me to, of course, uh, bring us up to date on uh, this particular uh, development is New Central's correspondent, Marshall Anthony Onoye, who is at uh, Jota monitoring happenings over there. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Marshall, thank you for joining in. Can you bring us up to speed as uh, what you have observed, you know, in the area at the moment? All right, Marshall, let me take that again. What have you observed, you know, around the Ojota axis and, uh, of course, at the moment? Strong presence of the policemen, whom earlier on I had spoken with the area commander of Area F, uh, ACP Idou, whom had said off camera that they are only here to ensure the safety of the protesters. Initially, some people whom we also spoke to off camera were apprehensive as to whether the police here were either for them or against them because they spoke to us about their awareness of, or rather their skepticism as to whether or not the, the government would be pro providing adequate security for them. But the uh, ACP, the area commander of RF had earlier on told us that they are here for the safety and security of the protesters. Mm. Back now, to you, Dai. All right. Now, let's talk about uh, Lagos residents right now. How, I mean, are they responding to the presence of uh, heavy security operatives? I mean, is it uh, affecting, you know, their day-to-day -day activity? Are they, you know, has it created some sort of apprehension? All right, uh, let me take that again. How are residents, you know, reacting to the presence of uh, the security personnel? Okay, so that I can't quite hear what you're saying, but I'd also like to add that, uh, well, if the camera can capture some of the uh, presence of the policemen here, and like I earlier on told you, we spoke with some of the residents of Ikeja, Ojota here uh, in Ikeja, and uh, we wanted to know whether they would be protesting uh, tomorrow. As you do know, the activists, legal activists, uh, senior advocate of Nigeria, Femi Palana, uh, as to the government providing uh, security and ensuring that protesters' lives are secured during 
the exercise of their, their uh, civil duty. And uh, these citizens are saying they might not come out to protest, despite the fact that they understand that there is hunger, so much hunger, as they put it, in the land. But they are apprehensive as to the safety of their lives. You would recall the NTAS protest uh, and what happened and how it ended. This has made people quite apprehensive. You'd also remember that earlier today we had news of uh, some CSOs pulling out from the NLC pro uh, proposed strike. Tudor, who is the national coordinator of JAF, uh, Joint Action Front, and he said they are pulling out of the NLC proposed strike, but they'll still find a way to protest themselves. Back to you, Dio. All right, uh, just before I let you go, in terms of uh, the, what I call it, uh, flow of traffic and movement and people going about their you know, day to day activities, uh, would you in any way say it's been affected? You're asking, of, you're asking about traffic and, yes. Tra flow of traffic. Uh, and commercial activities in yes. Ojasa here. Yes. You, well, you can see traffic flow is quite regular and uh, commercial activities are going on as usual. People seem to be going about their daily activities and their commercial business as usual. But you do know that the uh, NLC proposed protest is tomorrow. So we want to believe that the security presence here is to sort of create an awareness that these people can come out and protest, you know, wait them off. All right, uh, thank you so much for the update there, Marshal Onnoye, of course, on New Central. Thank you once again for your time. Well, let's take you back to uh, the, uh, of course, uh, second story where we told you that the TUC uh, recently, or just a few hours ago, uh, had a, what I call a press briefing as regards uh, uh, the state of affairs in the country. And they, of course, highlighted quite a number of, uh, of issues. Now, joining me on the news uh, to shed more light on this is News Central's uh, Marvelous Abou Manu. Marvelous, thank you for your time. Good. All right. Uh, once we are able to connect with Marvelous, of course, uh, we will... Uh, get that conversation rolling. But uh, still on the news at this time, Nigeria's uh, president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, has set up a tripartite committee, including key private sector players, some state governors, and several cabinet members expected to tackle the nation's forex crisis and also bring an end to the escalating inflation being witnessed in the country. Members of the committee, while speaking to newsmen after the meeting, expressed confidence that the nation's economic challenges will be addressed. Now, New Central's Amadine Oyi tells us more. Between September 2023 to February 2024, the U.S. dollar gained approximately 193% to the Nigerian Naira. This has caused an escalating inflation in the country, resulting to the increasing prices of basic commodities, notably foodstuff. In a bid to end this trend, President Bolatinubu met with members of the organized private sector, including several governors, to rescue the situation. We are looking for additional efforts that might help the downtrodden Nigerians, and we will provide that hope and the assurance that the economic recovery is on its way. It's a tripartite meeting and um, uh, designed to, you know, put heads together and to, to think together. We had a very, very good meeting and uh, what we discuss is generally about the uh, economy, food security, uh, you know, security of the nation. We discuss everything in detail. Players after the meeting say the issue of the rise in the dollar to the Naira which are affecting goods and services was discussed. You know, we have discussed on how to, you know, bring the foreign exchange, the rate down, because we all know that what is happening in, you know, as regards the foreign exchange is artificial, is manipulative, you know. Everything in Nigeria is indexed to the foreign exchange, especially... Uh, 
Uh, we sincerely apologize for that technical glitch. But uh, to shed more light on this particular issue, I'm joined in the studio uh, by the a financial analyst, uh, Kalu Aja. Thank you for your time, Kalu. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, let me start off with, uh, I mean, before that particular uh, soundbite went off, we saw, uh, of course, a, a businessman that, uh, 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 of course, the, the chairman of Boa Group, uh, talking about artificial manipulation of the FX. What's your immediate reaction to what he said? Well, the, the first thing to note is that uh, there's scarcity of dollars in Nigeria. That's the fact. Um, how much of that scarcity is driving the prices and how much is speculation is now, up, is now up in the air. But the fact is, if you want to buy dollars today, you're going to have limited supply. Hence, economics says the price has to go up. That's what we've been seeing from the 400 to 700 to the 1, 2, now to the 1, 4 and 1, 5 and all that. So there has to be some truth in that, that a bit of it is speculative because folks are moving from Naira to the dollar and a bit of it is, of course, caused by the supply, uh, the lack of supply of dollars uh, to the market. So a bit of both, yeah. Mm. Now, let's backtrack a bit. Now, mm -hmm. how significant uh, would you say this uh, particular uh, tripartite committee you know, is. And uh, do you think that it's timely? Well, it is timely. He's bringing in the private sector to say, hey, what can we do about the exchange rate? But remember, prices are determined by demand and supply. There's a huge demand, but the supply has not kept pace. Where's the supply? <clears throat> crude oil sales. That's where the problem is. Nigeria is not exporting enough crude oil today. Hence, you have limited supply. So the tripartite guys can come in and say, hey, this is how we can boost supply, maybe do FDIs, FPIs, and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, the, the, the real question is, how can we sell more crude oil from Nigeria to then earn more United States dollars that can then supply the market and take the pressure off? Remember, we're still owing um, lots of our standings from the CBN and all that to, to third mm. parties, airlines and all. So that is there, unless we take care of that, then the, whatever situation the tripartite committee makes can then start to have an effect. So in, in essence, it's time we go, we're going to get good advice from the guys in the private sector, but on the base of low supply. Let's keep that in mind. All right. Now, do you believe the committee's composition adequately represents the diverse interests and sectors of the Nigerian economy? Well, I think it went for the large cap um, private sector guys. You've got Boy, you've got Lumeli, you've got the, the large cap, the Dangote guys there. These are the guys that move the economy. Between Boa and Dangote, those are the largest caps in the, in the largest caps come to the Nigerian Stock Exchange. So that's where they're going to. These are the guys that would actually import and export, and they need Forex. And I'm worried about inflation. Again, let's not forget, inflation is a big issue in Nigeria. So those are the guys that sell set prices. So if we can reach an agreement, we wouldn't submit the guys and say, hey, let's not move prices up so much. If they can sort of agree, that, that helps, and I think that's why he's going for the big players. These are the guys that sell goods in billions to a larger uh, consumer class in Nigeria. So it might be a good idea to talk to them first. Maybe the SME guys should have been there as well, but I think we want to do top-down, uh, going from the big large-cap guys then to the marketplace as a whole. Now, let's talk about specific challenges. What areas do you think the committee should prioritize in stabilizing the economy? Inflation. That's mm. the number one issue in Nigeria, inflation, and specifically food inflation. So food inflation, the, 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 when we measure inflation, we measure the consumer price index. And that CPI in Nigeria is 51% food. So once food prices go up, CPI goes up, so your interest rates go up. If you want to buy a car or a computer, it goes up because food is expensive. So they have got to reach, find a way to bring down the cost of food in Nigeria. If you bring down the cost of food in Nigeria, CPI goes down, then hopefully the monetary policy rate also goes down because then you have less inflation. That's the number one challenge that they can do, inflation. It's a security challenge because you've got the bandits stopping for a harvest from, from the farmers. But it's also going to be an infrastructure and a coordination between the states and the federal. So inflation, specifically food inflation, is the number one. Then, of course, re revamping consumption in Nigeria. We have zero consumption. No one is spending because we earn so little. We've got to get consumption going back in Nigeria. So those two issues for them is what it should focus on. Yeah. All right, uh, before I let you go, now, uh, some have suggested that, you know, as much as uh, the president is, you know, uh, tackling this issue from the top, 
it's also important that you know it's also addressed from the base mm -hmm. because at the end of the day at the micro level uh, talking about you and I the family level I mean they're the ones that you know at the receiving end mm -hmm. what do you think can be done to ensure that um, uh, wholesalers retailers you know, some greedy elements don't take advantage of the situation to unnecessarily high prices. Yeah, you see, speculators only show up when there's limited supply. And the Nigerian worker hasn't seen his wages go up for decades. But inflation has gone up. So the Nigerian worker has sacrificed a lot. What needs to happen is going to be a concerted effort by the federal government to drop prices. I'll give you a good example. The customs was basing their duties on the FX um, exchange rate. Why? They could pick an arbitrary rate and say maybe 500 for the next six months, which means if you bring in a container, they're going to use a dollar to 500. Arbitrary right now for the next six months just to bring down prices of goods and services. Same way with the government. They can scrap all fees and levies and reduce the cost to the household. Because in the next three to six months, people are suffering. They need a salary cut and you can't give them money. So Cut your own income, i.e. the IGR, the federal government, and even the state governments, to then give the families a boost that they can then use to go to the marketplace and consume. We've really done sacrifice. We need the government, the states, federal, and the states to then come to it and also sacrifice their revenues so that we can get a boost in their incomes and then consume. Thank you so much for your time, Aja, and of course, uh, deeply appreciate. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll go on a quick break. When we return, we will, of course, be going to Abuja, where we will connect with our correspondent, Marvelous Obomano, to keep us up to speed as regards at the press briefing the TUC had earlier today. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, we told you earlier that the Trade Union Congress, TUC, has called on the federal government to fix a new minimum wage to tackle the rising cost of living in Nigeria. Of course, uh, the president spoke on Monday uh, in Abuja during a press briefing barely 24 hours before the commencement of the nationwide protest by the Nigeria Labour Congress over the high cost of living. Well, to shed more light on this and also give us insight is our correspondent, Marvelous Bowman, who is uh, in Abuja at the moment. Marvelous, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, let's uh, die. Let's, uh, of course, uh, get straight into it. Now, can you... Uh, keep us up to speed as regards uh, what was discussed and, of course, if at all, uh, the relevance of this particular press briefing. All right. Um, it's not very uh, unusual uh, when you see organized labor unions in Nigeria having um, different positions and stances on a particular issue, especially when it regards to the interests of the Nigerian worker. Now, you're aware that the Nigeria Labor Congress, during their last press conference last week, you know, said they were going for a two-day nationwide protest, which is supposed to start tomorrow and then a day after tomorrow. And then just today, the Trade Union Congress had a press conference where they are addressing the media on their positions regarding the, you know, two-day nationwide protest that was declared by the NLC. At that press conference, TUC made it clear that they were not going to join NLC on that particular protest. You know, so it is two organized labor unions in Nigeria having a different stance and position as it regards to the Nigerian worker. Now, what TUC said is that they had an ultimatum with the federal government. And you know, they signed what we call a 15-point agreement stance as at the 2nd of October, where both the organized labor union in Nigeria raised 15 key issues that borders around the Nigerian workers, talking about, uh, uh, you know, have a new minimum wage, wage award, the issues rocking the Nigeria National Union of Road Transport Workers, Retian, uh, for Nigeria to now pro start producing uh, PMS and all the rest. So in that 15 points agenda they raised, so TC is saying that even when they gave ultimatum, that if the government does not implement those things raised on those agreements they signed, that we're going to go on strike. So NLC, TUC said, yes, they had that letter jointly signed with the Nigerian Labor Congress. But since that period till January, they have looked at the body language of the government. And the government seems to be sincere and committed in, you know, identifying some of those issues and then providing solutions to those issues. 
that if you raise an ultimatum and say, if you don't do X, Y, Z, we are going to go to, for a nationwide strike, and then at the end of the day, the government is doing those things, that they see it as it is needless for them to go on that protest or join NLC to go for the strike. And they raised the issue. They said they talked about minimum wage. And government said the minimum wage is 30,000 naira. And the government, according to them, on their own benevolence, has raised 35,000 naira as, you know, wage award, making it 65,000 naira. And in the last four months, that government had cleared the backlog of that, you know, areas. That as they are talking to us, that government is processing payments of January and February. So government have paid from the September to December, and they are processing payment for January and February. And now, the second issue, talking about the issues rocking the National Union of Road Transport Worker, that government has resolved it. And that government has removed the tax incentive, and that the Minister of Finance has said they are no longer collecting that tax incentive. And then the issue of the refinery, you know, making our refineries work. As at last Wednesday, the TUC said they went with the Minister of State for Labor at the Potako refinery. And you know that TUC, they have also affiliation with Pengasin. So some of their members on ground, with the Minister of State for Labor told them that if all modalities are on ground and they finish all the paperwork, that by April, that Nigeria will start producing PMS. That is the, the turnaround maintenance they are doing on the first refinery. And then the second one they are also building, when those two start operating on an optimal capacity, that it will be giving Nigerians fuel by December. But the turnaround maintenance they did, mm. that that one will be working by April, so that government has been sincere, government has been fair, and government has kept their own baggage. That all the 15 issues they raised, that government is doing one or two things regarding to those issues. So they but, but, need but to that, give government don't you think, you know, the opportunity I mean, to work been... more. So they feel like what they have done, and that is why they are not joining on the protest. Mm. But don't you think? I mean, like it's been speculated that uh, uh, this might just uh, sort of reflect a crack you know, uh, in, uh, when it comes to these unions, because we know that before now, uh, it used to be, you know, the TUC and, of course, the NLC, you know, in sync on matters like this. But don't you think that uh, this some sort of reflects uh, a crack, maybe, you know, between the relationships you of know, both uh, groups? You know, you know, when I started this interview, I said it's very, you know, unusual for the organized labor unions in Nigeria, both the TUC and NLC, you know, whenever they are, you know, taking a stance, they always take that stance together as a one uh, indivisible entity. But now it's, it's, it's something that is not often that they both are differing on their positions. Yeah, some people are saying probably there may be something must have gone under the boat. And you never can tell. All these things are still in the realm of speculation. But then you know that where there are two sisters in the house, those sisters can have different perceptions and ideologies on a particular case. This one might say, let's do it this one. This person might say, let's do it. It doesn't necessarily mean there is a crack in the relationship, just different ideologies. But one thing I can tell you, TUC said they are having a meeting with the government this evening. At the end of that meeting, we can not really know for sure if they are going to follow their sisters to embark on this nationwide protest by tomorrow or not. But they are saying to be all fair with the government, that government has shown commitment willingness and government have begun to do some of the things that have raised and right. so it is only fair that if they are doing it that they should sit back and watch if they will do it to its you know fullness so that's just what they are saying and then they also call for the review of the minimum wage that with the way the nigeria's economy is configured at present even with the 65,000, even when they go to negotiate another new minimum wage what the what the how naira is devaluing at this moment in time may not be enough so they are also calling for a review all right uh, Mabelas Obomano, thank you so much for your time and insight. And of course, uh, moving on on the news at this time, uh, pro nothing group, the Arawa Consultative Forum, has tasked uh, Nigeria's political elite to rally behind the government to solve the current economic hardship being witnessed in the country. The vice chairman of the forum, Abubakar Giyeri, uh, during a State of the Nation address in Yola, the Adama State Capital, urged the political office holders to contribute a part of their monthly salaries to government to help support citizens in need below the poverty bracket. He urged President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to make this possible via an executive order. This is a new government as far as I'm concerned. Whether ready or not, he should be advised on how to go about it. 
properly, and that's exactly what I'm doing, and that's what I'm urging other Nigerians who are concerned, who are patriotic, who are uh, interested in the well-being of this country to assist our leaders to do something. The president should issue a presidential order asking all office holders at national, political office holders, at national, state, and local government to sacrifice and contribute 40 percent of their salaries and allowances for the next two years towards ameliorating the pains of Nigerians. That will be our own contribution, our own sacrifice to us. Away from that, the Defense Headquarters has delivered a resolute response to quell rumors of a coup plot allegedly looming over the country. In a statement issued earlier today, Brigadier General Tuka Gusau, the acting director of Defense Information, refuted claims circulating by an online media outlet as suggesting heightened alert within the Presidential Guard Brigade amid suspicion of an impending coup. The Defense Headquarters condemned what it regarded as unfounded assertions, labeling them as mere fabrications intended to sow discard and panic among the populace. Meanwhile, the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, reiterated the unwavering commitment of the armed forces to uphold democracy, dismissing any notion of subversion. The news continues in West Africa, where a fresh attack on a mosque in eastern Burkina Faso has killed dozens of people. Security officials on Monday say armed individuals attacked a mosque in the Nathiamboni uh, on Sunday around 5 a.m., resulting in several dozens being killed. Local residents say the victims were all Muslims, most of them men who had come from uh, for the morning prayers. This event happened on the same day as at least 15 civilians were killed in the attack on a Catholic church during Sunday Mass in the north of the country. Political analysts say the ANC manifesto has no surprises, as it recycled old materials. According to analysts, the party has mastered is to identify challenges, but after elected, they don't address them. Issues of wealth uh, inequality and also extreme high unemployment. Gender-based violence has reached crisis proportions and corruption threatens uh, the young democracy. Now, the ANC launched its uh, manifesto at the same venue where the economic freedom fighters launched theirs weeks ago. Now, joining me on the news to discuss this is a political analyst, Sifo Sepe. Thank you for your time. And of course, uh, let's start off with this. Your analysis on the ANC manifesto they presented over the weekend. And uh, do you think that uh, the ANC plans to effectively uh, keep to its promises, particularly to the citizens in the upcoming polls? I think the first thing that we must indicate is that the ANC has been in power for the last eight years. And the, in the, for the last eight years, it has made a number of promises. And those promises have remained the same. So the, if one were to judge people on the basis of experience and history and promises, the ANC has failed for the last eight years. It is not likely to succeed if it's given another five years. And in trying to come up with a manifesto, it understands very full, understands full well what South Africans are going through. First, we were exposed to load shedding. Two, we have high unemployment. Three, we have a deepening poverty. Four, we have a, a young people, people who are hopeless, and we also have the land issue not being resolved. We also have race, race issues. We have gender violence. All these issues are known to the ANC. And because South Africans experience that, the ANC tends to repeat the, exactly the same things. But uh, as we often say, there was nothing new and we didn't expect anything new but what has happened is that in the last five years we have seen the, the worsening of the economic situation in south africa we've seen the highest unemployment we have seen the highest inequality we have seen corruption being entrenched and all these are the promises that the current administration had made about five years ago so they had failed dismally 
So to expect them to do better next time, it's almost like uh, choosing to be blind to the fact that uh, you are dealing with people who have failed. So the ANC enters these elections with a loss of credibility, with a loss of believability. So are you saying, but, I'm sorry to cut in here, are you saying that none of the key promises made you know, by the ANC in their manifesto actually resonate with uh, most of the voters, particularly South Africans? They resonate in terms of the issues that have been raised. The people have no problem in identification of the problem. But the, what they have a problem with is that these are the same issues that the ANC had raised in the last elections, in the elections before that, and in the last 20 years. And it has not made any move. Instead, we have seen things getting worse to mm. an extent that we have a mushrooming of political parties. The mushroom of these political parties are in themselves a statement that the ANC is no longer a leader of society. They are actually saying we can no longer entrust these people. This is why many parties and South Africans are saying these coming elections will be like in 1994. It will be almost like a, a total reset. For the first time, all the polls indicate that the ANC will get less than 50%. So for the first time, we are going to start taking what we call a so are you government. saying are you saying that uh, uh, the ANC, you know, uh, in the previous election, going back to their manifesto, didn't uh, achieve anything? Is that what you're suggesting? Oh, definitely. Actually, if anything, things have become worse since Ramaphosa took over. Unemployment has become uh, higher and un un unsustainable. Corruption has become entrenched. And when people talk about corruption, they start first with the president of the ANC, Ramaphosa. We must also remember that this is the same president who is known to have hidden thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the mattress. What type of a president does that? And the next thing, instead of being investigated, he has actually... Sibo, are you there? Okay. Good. Yes, I'm here. Okay, we, we lost you for a moment. But, uh, I mean, let's look uh, back at, uh, of course, the previous elections. Uh, we know that the ANC has enjoyed quite, you know, an array of support, you know, in the past. Uh, do you see that? What do you see yes. happening in this uh, upcoming poll? You said something about well, uh, have... a paradigm shift, but uh, what, what exactly, you know, are we looking at, in your own words? Well, the South Africans are saying they gave the ANC enough time to lead. And if you look at the last three elections or four elections, the ANC has been progressively losing support. And this is the first time that it will lose so much support that it will go below 50%. You need to understand that in 1994, the ANC won almost all the big cities in this country. It won all the provinces in this country. But right now, it has lost completely the Western Cape. It does not even bother. And it is clinging to KwaZulu Natal, which is one of the biggest provinces, and Gauteng. These are the major uh, provinces where you have the biggest metros. So if it loses those two, then you are going to have a party that is only supported by old people and also people in rural areas. Mm. Now, let's talk about the voters themselves. Uh, do you see a situation where you would, uh, would uh, eventually see on that day large voter turnout? What's the voter behavior looking like you know, uh, at the moment? Well, for now, uh, people seem to be very excited about uh, voting. And the reason why they are excited about voting is mainly because they think for the first time there might be a new political realignment. For some people, they chose not to vote because they knew that the ANC was going to win anyway. Now, with the possibility of the ANC losing, there has been a heightened interest by people to say, maybe it's time for us to become interested in politics. But at the same time, you also have some diehards of the ANC who are also seeing this possibility. And they are also equally excited and energized to make sure that the AC remains in power. So on both sides, there's a sense of excitement and involvement and mobilization. So I do think that there will be a, ten, a major turnout than we have seen in the, in the last elections. All right, uh, Sifo Sefe, thank you so much for your time.
You're welcome. Former United States President Donald Trump is one step closer to the Republican presidential nomination after a massive win over Nikki Haley in South Carolina. Trump won his primary opponent's home state by a 20-point margin, his fourth consecutive victory. As he ce celebrated, and now Trump made no mention of Haley, who vowed to stay in the race. Instead, he set his sights on the general election in November. Harley, who once served as a popular two-term governor of South Carolina, congratulated her, op her opponent on his victory in a speech. She promised not to quit, however, saying that roughly 40% of the vote she received was not some tiny group. Now, joining me on the news to give more insight on this is our international correspondent, Afua Hagen. Now, um, Nikki Haley faced a sore defeat in the state of which she was twice the governor. I mean, what's your reaction to this? A sore defeat indeed for Nikki Haley, but her saying there that the 40% of the votes that she received was no small amount. And she says that that still means that there's a huge proportion of voters who don't want Donald Trump or don't want Joe Biden. So she is pressing on. Now, she says that she is a woman of her word. She said, I'm not giving up this fight when a majority of American voters disapprove of both Trump and Joe Biden. She said there are a huge number of voters in our Republican primaries who are saying they want an alternative. So Nikki Haley has vowed that she's going to stay in the race till at least Super Tuesday. That's on the 15th of March, and that's when we'll see 16 states cast their ballots cast their ballots, excuse me, on the very same day. And it's thought that whoever wins Super Tuesday is more than guaranteed to go on and be the nominee, whether it's for the Democrats or for the Republicans. I mean, it's been a, a tough fight between uh, Trump and, of course, uh, the opponents, you know, in the Republican Party. But Trump's uh, popularity continues. How likely is he to uh, make the presidential nomination? You're absolutely right in saying it has been a tough fight, but it's one that Trump does seem to be winning at the moment. Now, exit polling uh, over the weekend uh, was showing that Trump is still hugely popular. He's hugely popular amongst people who describe themselves as super conservative and both men and women, which is, you know, quite shocking, I think. Uh, and he is doing well in the polls. That cannot be denied. But Nikki Haley's pockets are deeper than Trump's at this moment, which is mm. also surprising. In the month of January, she raised $16.5 million alone. And that was her largest monthly total. And that's more than Trump's numbers. And remember that he has half a billion dollars, which he has to pay in fines, as well as those other legal cases, which are going to uh, take up his resources. So yes, he is hugely popular in the vote at the moment, but whether he has uh, the capital and the money within the campaign to keep going and keep pushing that remains to be seen, but he may not even need that because he remains to be so popular. He himself got up on stage and said he'd never seen the Republican Party so unified. And perhaps at this moment, they are unified behind Donald Trump. So I think we can expect to see Joe Biden and Donald Trump squaring up again in the general election in America in November. But nothing is certain. Like I said, Super Tuesday on the 5th of March is going to be a big date. Mm. And if Nikki Haley and her deep pockets can keep pushing on, she may be the comeback kid. We just don't know. I mean, interesting times. But, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to also ask, I mean, Trump seems to be winning in spite of the many, you know, obstacles and huddles, particularly, you know, legal huddles. What do you think, I mean, uh, could be his wild card? What is Trump, uh, what does he have that maybe other candidates don't? And do you think uh, Nikki might be gunning for the post of vice president? I think that Donald Trump is capitalizing on a right-wing rhetoric that people are really akin to at the moment across the world, but especially in the United States. I think he's also capitalizing on the mistakes that Joe Biden in his presidency are making, whether that's over the war in Ukraine or whether that's over the war in Israel and Gaza. I'm not saying that Trump's approach on either of those would be very different. In fact, we know his approach on Ukraine would be 
be very different. He says that he could end that war, you know, in his first week in office. It, when it comes to Israel, Gaza, he's not so clear on what he would do there. But I think he is capitalizing on these things. He's also capitalizing on the fact that the Democrats don't really have another front runner who could take them home. There is no real alternative to Joe Biden. So squaring up for that second election, you know, he's also kind of captured the imagination of people who insist that he was ousted from office, that it's all a conspiracy, and that he is the rightful president and he deserves the second bite of the apple. He is really playing up to all those elements and all those things. I don't necessarily believe that he is ever popular and people agree with everything that he said, but I think a lot of people are unhappy with the status quo of the Democrats in power and of Joe Biden and, in a way, Kamala Harris. And he is seen as the only alternative. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Afwa. Thank you. The World Trade Organization opened a high-level ministerial meeting in Abu Dhabi on Monday with calls for consensus as geopolitical tensions and the looming U.S. election undermine chances of a major breakthrough. The WTO's 13th ministerial conference is scheduled to run until Thursday in Abu Dhabi. The capital of the United Arab Emirates is the first in two years. The WTO is hoping to progress uh, particularly on fishing, agriculture and electronic commerce, adding that the challenges for those gathering in the UAE is the war in Gaza and related attacks in Yemeni by Yemeni rebels on the ships in the Red Sea a campaign that has disrupted global maritime trade. Speaking at the opening ceremony of the Abu Dhabi meeting, WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iweala called on the trade ministers to reach consensus on MC13 decisions this week. We are in an even tougher place today. Looking around, uncertainty and instability are everywhere. Geopolitical tensions have worsened. Conflict has spread as we see here in the Middle East, and away from the headlines across parts of Africa and the Arab world. We must not forget the conflict in Sudan, which has displaced close to 8 million, million people internally and across borders, or the conflict in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that's a wrap on the news at this time. But before we go, another look at some of our top stories. We told you that TUC calls for minimum wage as labor unions insist on strike. Nigerian army denies alleged coup plot. And also we told you that dozens killed in fresh Burkina Faso attack. Don't forget to send in your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times, channel 274, Abo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching and Dakbo Adibui. Bye for now.